On the end of my finger here is a small piece of plastic, maybe four millimeters square. And on this piece of plastic are over a thousand hemispherical lenslets, making up a micro lens array. Each lenslet in the array is only a couple microns tall and 10 to 15 micrometers wide. This process involved lasers, ablating silicon, some really nasty etchants, and molding. But I wasn't originally planning to make a microlens array. It was all kind of happenstance based on some accidental discoveries while working on a different project. So today's video is going to be a little bit of a story of where I started and the debugging steps to figure out what was going on and how I ended up with this microlens array. So this project starts with a different technique that I was attempting to get to work called Metal Assisted Chemical Etching, or MACE for short. This technique is used to etch silicon in a very selective manner, and you might want this if you're making like MEMS devices, accelerometers, gyros, anything that needs kind of silicon to be etched in specific geometric patterns to make kind of a three-dimensional structure. And now there's lots of ways you can etch silicon. A lot of times the wet chemical methods need a hard mask on top of the silicon with something like silicon nitride. You can also use things like deep reactive ion etching, which essentially fills a chamber full of reactive gases and then hits the silicon with an ion beam and that etches in a very kind of deep manner. But MACE is an alternative to all of those and it uses a pretty clever mechanism that was only somewhat recently discovered. MACE works by using a specific etchant and a noble metal, typically gold, but sometimes silver as well. And the way it works is that the etchant is composed of hydrofluoric acid and hydrogen peroxide. And on their own, they don't really etch silicon, but when you combine these with the noble metal, the metal begins to act as a catalyst for the hydrogen peroxide, and that will selectively oxidize the surface right under the metal. And then from there, the oxidized silicon becomes silicon dioxide, which the hydrofluoric can etch, and it will remove that thin layer and the metal sinks and the process repeats. And so what ends up happening is that the metal acts as a selective region of oxidation and you slowly get etching just where the metal is and everything else is left untouched. So I was attempting to get this technique to work and as of yet, completely failed. I haven't gotten it to work at all. I wasn't sure if etching was happening or not, if it was just really slow, so I deposited a thin layer of silver on my silicon wafer and then ablated away a stripe of the silver using my laser. And the idea was that the spot under the laser would be free of silver and everything else would still have the silver on it, so you should see some kind of differential effect between the ablated region and the silver-coated region as it sinks. And I didn't see that at all. In fact, I saw the opposite. When you look at the scans, you can see that the ablated region has smoothed out really nicely and it makes this really kind of smooth, dimpled crater, whereas all the silver region is essentially untouched and not really porous or etched at all. And I know from previous experiments using the laser on a silicon that these impact craters are much more violent than this. There's lots of like ejecta thrown around and there's usually a kind of like a lip around the edge, a little melt puddle. And so I was intrigued by this really smooth surface and it wasn't what I expected. Now, of course, it doesn't make any sense because the etchant shouldn't be touching the bare silicon there. And so I wasn't sure what was causing this, but I thought it might be interesting to try to find out and maybe we could leverage this kind of spherical nature to make a micro lens array. So that's where this project was born and I started debugging this interesting phenomena and I came up with two potential explanations as to what was going on. The first one is that when the laser pulse hits the silicon, it melts and ablates a whole bunch of stuff and leaves behind a pretty thick crust of oxidized silicon, silicon dioxide. And so it's nothing special, it's just a bunch of glass and when you put it in this etchant, the hydrofluoric acid will remove that kind of remelted silicon dioxide layer and you're left with a nice smooth crater. That was a really easy hypothesis to test. All we had to do was rerun the same laser parameters on a bare piece of silicon with no silver and then put it in the etchant. But looking at the scans, we can see that absolutely nothing happened. It looks essentially pristine. Okay, so if it's not oxidation, maybe it actually is the metal assisted chemical etching process and there's just something unique about the laser ablation spot relative to everywhere else. Now I know from my own experiments as well as the literature that these laser pulses do a certain amount of melting in the region and the way it functions essentially the pulse comes in it's absorbed by the bulk silica material 
and melts violently. And if there's enough energy, it blates outward. But if there's not enough energy, it kind of just mixes into a little puddle and you might get some rippling on the surface. And so my theory was that maybe the silver layer is being incorporated into the molten silicon in that 100 nanosecond time period. This experiment was a little more complicated to get set up. Essentially, we want silver to be only where the laser strikes are, but nowhere else. The way I ended up doing it was to spin a thin layer of photoresist onto the silicon wafer and expose it. So now we have the whole surface essentially masked off. And on top of that, we put a thin layer of silver. So we've got silicon, photoresist, silver. And then we run our laser ablation scheme and the laser should have no problem ablating through the silver and the photoresist and kind of mixing it all up. And then we can strip the photoresist off later using just solvents, and that will take any of the silver that wasn't kind of incorporated into the silicon and remove it. And saw some very confusing results. We got a very porous silicon structure everywhere, both on the ablation craters as well as everywhere else that doesn't have any silver at all which really confused me for a long time because there shouldn't be any chemical reaction happening outside of the crater if the theory about the silver being incorporated is correct. So I backed up and thought about it a little bit more, and it occurred to me that maybe this etchant does in fact etch silicon by itself just very slowly, even if there's no metal catalyst present. This could be a well-known effect that I just don't know about, but I couldn't find it in the literature anywhere definitively that this particular etchant will etch silicon just by itself with no metal catalyst. It was an easy enough thing to test though. You take a clean bare piece of silicon, you throw it in the etchant and just leave it overnight. And sure enough, I got a very similar result. Lots of porosity kind of all over the wafer. So what that leads me to believe is that the original smoothing effect that we saw in the first impact craters is just a generic isotropic etching behavior where this etching is slowly kind of smoothing out all the little ripples of the impact crater. And actually the silver that I had deposited to act as a selective etching was somehow acting as a mask and preventing the etching from touching all the stuff under the silver, which is kind of the opposite of what it was supposed to be doing. And if that is the case that this is just indiscriminate etching any exposed silicon surface, well then we can switch to a much better etching known as HNA. HNA is composed of hydrofluoric acid, nitric acid, and acetic acid. The nitric is used to oxidize the surface of the silicon and makes a thin layer of silicon dioxide. Hydrofluoric then removes that silicon dioxide layer and the process repeats. The acetic acid is used to help kind of wet the surface. The bare silicon surface is hydrophobic and so it's difficult to get the hydrofluoric and the nitric acid in intimate contact with the new newly formed silicon, and so you get kind of rough, uneven etching. But if you add something like acetic acid in there, it kind of wets out the surface and allows a better, smoother finish. I didn't have acetic acid, and I was using super dilute reagents anyway, so I skipped it. So mine is essentially an HNH, hydrofluoric and nitric. Now I do want to stop and take a quick moment to talk safety. I don't normally do safety speeches on this channel. I kind of figure that if you're replicating anything that I'm doing here, you're doing your own research as well. You know what laser goggles to get or what chemicals are involved in electroplating, that sort of thing. But hydrofluoric and nitric are both particularly unpleasant substances that I feel like I should give some kind of disclaimer on. So nitric acid, is a very strong oxidizer. It will happily set things on fire. It will happily burn a hole through your skin if you're not careful. The fumes are quite unpleasant for you. It's all around just not a good thing to be dealing with outside of a controlled environment. Hydrofluoric is arguably even worse in that it can kill you with a very small amount that gets on your skin because it penetrates rapid through your skin. You don't feel it because it causes no external burns. And then it'll start sequestering all the calcium and magnesium in your body leading to strokes and other kind of organ failures. So all that's to say, these are both very bad. They get worse when you put them together and you really need a full set of PPE to even consider working with this stuff, right? Complete long sleeves, long pants, closed toed shoes, lab coat, goggles, face mask, two pairs of gloves, nitrile with something like butyl rubber on top. And ideally you'd be doing this in a fume hood or some other controlled place to keep the fumes away.
The safe exposure level for hydrofluoric is two parts per million, which comes out to 0 0.0001 molar, which is extremely dilute. Like it doesn't take very much hydrofluoric to start becoming very problematic quickly. I did not enjoy this part of the experiment. I don't really know if I'll be working with hydrofluoric ever again. It was a very paranoid inducing experience. Honestly, the only good thing about HNA as opposed to say like the mace etchant is that because it contains the nitric, if you get some on you, you'll know immediately because it's burning a hole through your glove and through your skin. Whereas with the regular hydrofluoric, you might not know that you splashed a little on you. So, you know, there's always a silver lining. Right, safety disclaimer out of the way. Let's get back to the experiment. Because this was such an unpleasant set of liquids to deal with and I was all get up in my PPE, I don't really have a lot of footage of this because I didn't want to deal with a camera and lighting and trying not to contaminate my gear with this terrible chemical. But it's very straightforward. You essentially run the laser protocol to get the ablation marks, throw it in the HNA for some period of time, and out the other end, you should get a nicely etched surface. I let it etch overnight just to see what would happen, give it the most time possible, and we get some really deep etchings. All of the laser marks are extremely smooth, have very low surface roughness, and have etched pretty deeply from their original starting point. Because they etch so deeply, we're essentially seeing only the very bottoms of the, the spherical ablation marks, and so there's a lot of heavy overlap between all the pulse strikes. Due to misalignments either in the laser system or astigmatism or just, you know, the sample wasn't perfectly planar under the laser, there's kind of an oblong or oval aspect to all the laser marks, which is why you get kind of this more triangular or hexagonal structure, which is kind of cool. Under the AFM, we can see that the surface is super smooth, as well as a pretty sharp peak between all the different spots, which was kind of cool to see. I didn't know how much the, the individual overlapped regions would smooth out, but it does seem to maintain a pretty crisp line between each pulse spot. I repeated the experiment, but with a shorter amount of time etching, and we can see from the scans that it wasn't quite enough time. It smooths it out, but there's still a lot of kind of molten recast material around the edges, Inside of the craters, there's different spots of kind of like lumpy material that didn't get quite etched away. At this point, we've basically created a mold, and now we just need to fill it with some type of polymer to make the microlens array itself. In the industry, microlenses are made with injection molding or hot embossing, something that you can make really cheap at enormous scales. In academia, it tends to be done with PDMS, which is like a two-part curing silicon mixture that's used for literally everything in academia. And so that's the route I went with was PDMS. And so you take your PDMS, you mix it up together, degas it to get all the air bubbles out, take your mold, in this case the silicon, and coat it with a mold release. I used Ease Release 205, just kind of a generic off-the-shelf mold release. In academia, they use a specific chemical to silenate the surface. I chose to spin coat it to get a very thin layer of mold release. And then you pour on your PDMS, let that spread out a little bit, spin coat that also to get a very thin coating, and then degas it another time. And from here, it's a little tricky because essentially we need to take that very thin layer of PDMS and transfer it onto a glass slide because it's too thin to do anything on its own. You can't handle it. And I tried a couple different routes. The classic traditional way in academia is to plasma bond it to the glass. And the way you do this is you put the glass slide and the PDMS cured micro lens in a plasma chamber and expose it to oxygen or air plasma for a couple minutes. And what that'll do is make both of the surfaces reactive and you squish them together and they'll bond together pretty much permanently. I tried that and I couldn't quite get it to work. I got it to work a little bit, but the edges of the wafer tend to build up a little extra PDMS during the spin coating, kind of like an, an edge effect that happens, which means the surface isn't perfectly smooth. So when you try to bond them together, only the edges actually bond and that kind of ruins the process. I'm sure I could get this to work by like cutting off the edges or something, but it seemed like too much work. So I just tried a simpler method, which was sticking the glass slide on top of the uncured PDMS, degassing them together in the chamber, curing it all as one unit, and then peeling them off. And that worked great. 
From there, it's just a matter of popping over to the light microscope and seeing if we actually made a micro lens, right? So this is supposed to be focusing light a short distance away from the lenslets. And we can see that ah, we kind of made some micro lenses. Like, depending on which parameters you look at, they look better or worse. <laughs> so some of them focus to a roughly spherical point, which is pretty encouraging. Some of them have more of an oblong or even like a zigzag focus pattern, which is all due to the artifacts of the laser parameters and the etchant profiles. The wafer that I etched overnight, the really deep profiles, I assumed would work really well because they had a nice smooth profile, but because of the nature of the kind of astigmatism in the etchings where they're like hexagonal or oblong, it gives you kind of line focus points where it focuses to a, a linear line rather than a nice point, which makes sense in retrospect. It's you know, optics that would happen. And in contrast, the silicon sample that I etched only for a couple hours and it still looked kind of cruddy uh, gave us pretty nice focal points. And that's because there's a lot more of that sphere that's left over. It's interesting to note these little kind of pock marks or bubbles on the edges of pretty much all of the micro lenses. We know from looking at the silicon that those don't exist in the mold. So this is purely an artifact of the molding process. And for a long time, I thought these were actual bubbles, like air that was either trapped in the mold or maybe it was dissolved in the PDMS and wasn't fully degassed. Uh, but I re-ran the experiment a few different times, gave it really long degassing periods, and I always had them. So what I think this is, is actually the mold release inside the mold itself. So in academia, I mentioned they use a specific chemical to silenate the surface of the silicon and that keeps it from sticking so much. And that's essentially what this stuff does. I looked up on the MSDS and it has similar chemicals, but this also includes silicon solids as well. And so this is depositing a thin layer of silicone on top of the surface. And you'll notice that all of these little pockmarks are all facing the same direction. I'm pretty sure that's the direction that I was spinning the wafer in when I added the mold release. And so what I think is happening is that the mold release is being dropped on, it's spinning out, and a lot of it gets flung off, but a little tiny bit extra builds up in the corners of all of the kind of spherical craters. And so you get a little extra mold release right there, and it makes a little blob that then when you mold over it, you know, that's that. You have a little pockmark. So that's my current theory. I found that when I spun the release on at a much higher RPM to get a thinner layer, the effect was reduced. And that's kind of what led me to believe that this is in actuality what's happening. One really cool thing about this project is I ran into a lot of other interesting phenomena, which I'm not going to talk about today, but I would like to explore in the future. For example, certain parameters of the laser will induce these little micro spikes, which are about a micron tall and have a tip radius of about 200 to 400 nanometers. So that's kind of cool and it's very repeatable. You can generate them all day long using a specific pattern. You can also make these kind of little half filled dimples that aren't a full ablation crater, but they're also not a spike somewhere in between, like a little bubble that popped. Using a different set of parameters, you can etch very deep trenches without making a big kind of impact crater like you normally would get. And that allows you to mold really high aspect ratio ridges, although they're pretty gnarly looking. They're not like a nice clean ridge. Uh, there's some interesting effects that if you use hot potassium hydroxide, which is an anisotropic etch, you can get cool structures. So there's a lot of interesting things that could follow on with this by just playing with some of the other artifacts that come out of specific laser patterns. But I'm sure this video is already far, far too long. So we're just going to put a pin in that and talk about it some future day. All in all, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. It wasn't what I wanted. I really wanted that metal etching to work. Maybe we'll revisit that in the future. I'll keep working on it. But I was excited to see this kind of tangent payoff in a really interesting way. So I think that's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this kind of tumultuous journey to making a micro lens. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.